And, uh, and that is, we're going to be doing a virtual tour uh, of the Har Herzl, Mount Herzl Military Cemetery here in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, we've titled it Multiple Identities in Israel, uh, the National Military Cemetery as a Case Study. And before we begin the actual tour, um, I'd like to focus on the theme of our seminar, that is identity. And in particular, I'd like to begin by focusing on the question of collective identity versus individual identity. And um, let, me, uh, let me be a little bit uh, more precise. Uh, the collective identity in the pre-state period in Palestine and in Israel in its first decades was clearly paramount. And clearly, in the last few decades, it has receded as individual identity has come to assert itself uh, more so. But probably in Israel, collective identity is still more powerful than in most individualistic Western societies. So the first question I want to address is what are the roots of this very strong collective identity that still exists in Israel, but was even much more powerful uh, in the early period of the state. And I, I'd like to open up to the chat um, for what you think. What are the roots of this very strong collective identity? Why was it so strong in Israel, stronger than in most Western societies uh, then and to some extent today as well? Feel free to write on your chat. Um, okay, so I see survival. Good. The fact that uh, Israel was threatened uh, from it, its very creation uh, is certainly a factor that brings people together, that creates the collective. We sell the land as a group. Okay, to some extent true. People came as individuals, but they also came oftentimes in waves. Um, compulsory, compulsory military service for many or most Israelis, I think absolutely true. The idea that you have to do national service, whether it's volunteer service or in the vast majority of cases, the army, uh, it certainly creates a collective feeling. Um, I would contrast it to the experience of most American Jews uh, who at the age of 18 go off to college and that's a real individual uh, growth experience uh, as opposed to in Israel, you go into a situation where you have to wear the same color uniform as everybody else. And you have to uh, be part of army discipline. And you have inculcated in you the idea that you're serving a larger cause uh, than just yourself. Uh, so you even have to um, depreciate uh, your individual identity. Um, realization of millennial long mission. Yes, I, I, the, the ideology, absolutely. Visceral connection. Rejection of past secular national and diaspora Jewish identity. Yes, we're going to come to this shortly. I think it's, it's very important. Um, so I would even go back further. All of these answers I think are true, but I would go back further and say that this strong collective identity is actually rooted in Jewish tradition. Think about it for a moment. Do we pray as individuals or are we encouraged to pray in a collective? We're encouraged to pray in a minyan, in a quorum of at least 10, however you define those 10. That is, we pray in community. And the language of our prayer, when you think about it, the language of prayer is almost always in plural. There are very few prayers in our entire liturgy where we use the first person singular. We're almost always praying in the first person plural. Um, so I, th I think that this is, this is rooted in our tradition, this idea of a collective identity being very strong. It's not that you're not allowed to pray by yourself. You can, but it's preferable to pray with a minyan. Uh, and I would say that it's true also about the sense of responsibility that Jews have for one another. 
And this is reflected in the saying of the rabbis, Kol Yisrael arevin zebazeh, all Israel is responsible for one another. And in modern times, we know that it's been reflected in organizations like the Joint Distribution Committee, the JDC, created because American Jews felt a great responsibility to help Jews in Eastern Europe, it happened to have been in the early 20th century, who they felt were in trouble and needed their help. Federations, the whole federation system is based on the idea that we're responsible for one another, this collective identity. Um, there's a beautiful article written in the 19th century by a Russian Jewish woman named Pauline Wengerov. Um, I think the title of the uh, book that she wrote is called Diary of a Grandmother. I highly recommend it. She has one little piece there that's so interesting. She's talking about the Jews in St. Petersburg in the late 19th century, some of whom actually converted to Russian Orthodoxy in order to be accepted to universities, in order to have greater opportunities. And she writes about how that those baptized Jews would nonetheless use whatever influence and power they had in the government to help Jews in need. So it runs very deep in our tradition, this idea of collective identity. A second factor I would cite is modern Zionism. Modern Zionism was dominated by a socialist ethos until 1977. And that was true in the pre-state era, and that was true in the first 29 years of the state's existence. And when you think about the socialist ethic as opposed to the capitalist ethic, the socialist ethic prioritizes, at least in theory, the common good as opposed to capitalism, which emphasizes individual freedom, rugged individualism. In the pre-state and early years of the state, the early decades of the state, the kibbutz was the ideal. A disproportionate number of the generals and political leaders of our country in its first decades came from the kibbutzim. The elite units in the army were dominated by kibbutznikim, even if they were a small percentage of the population. A third factor I would cite is the melting pot idea for immigrants who came to this country. You know, in Israel's first two years of existence, it doubled its population. In two years, immigrants coming from the DP camps in Europe, immigrants coming from Arab countries, and shortly thereafter, there were other waves of immigration in the 50s from North Africa and later the 60s as well. And up until the, the massive Russian Aliyah uh, in the 1990s, which already had a little bit of a different feel, and we'll talk about that. And as, as someone mentioned before, the idea of negating the diaspora, the idea of creating a new Jew, an Israeli national identity was very, very strong in those days. So for example, David Ben-Gurion is not David Ben-Gurion. His name was David Green or David Gruen. But when he came to Palestine, he took on a Hebrew name, Ben-Gurion, the son of a lion cub, in order to, first of all, Hebraicize his name. It's also a symbol of rebirth to give yourself a new name. And he wasn't alone. Most of the leaders of our country in the early decades took on Hebrew names. And it wasn't only the leaders. It was a very common thing that people did. I, you know, my name is Bernstein. And some of you uh, who are from the New York area and are old enough may remember the wonderful restaurant called Schmulke Bernstein's on the Lower East Side, the first kosher Chinese restaurant. And Schmulke Bernstein's had on their menu uh, the name Bernstein in Chinese letters. Well, how did they write Bernstein in Chinese letters? Well, I learned from the menu that Bernstein means amber. It's the stone, amber. Bernstein, okay? And so, the, uh, and so that's what Bernstein means. Well, I know somebody who, when he came to Israel, 
in the 1970s, I believe, he changed his name from Bernstein to Inbar. Inbar is Hebrew for Amber, because he didn't want to have that diaspora name. He wanted to be part of this new society, or as we call it sometimes, a melting pot, uh, and be that, that new Jew and have that rebirth. I remember when I made Aliyah, I asked my father, how would you feel if I uh, changed my name from Bernstein to Inbar? I didn't know if I wanted to do it or not, but I asked him. He didn't like the idea at all. And that certainly put the kibosh on it. Um, but more than that, there was a preference for the Hebrew language. The language was going to unify the people. When you think about it, in the early days of the state, certainly up until 1948, in 1948, 90% of the Jews living in Palestine were Ashkenazim. Yiddish could easily have become the language of this country. But there was a very concerted effort that Yiddish not be the language of this country. And for that matter, not Ladino either. And the reason was that they wanted to create a new Jew. They wanted to create a new society with its own national language and not a language of the diaspora. And of course, they were going back to the Bible, biblical Hebrew. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that whether they intended it or not, it actually was very fortunate for the Jews from Arab countries, the Mizrahim or Sfaradim, who came. Uh, that Hebrew became the language of the country. Many of them were familiar with Hebrew. Yiddish would have been a terrible burden for them. And last but not least, there was even some suppression of ethnic identities. Part of this idea of negating the diaspora and creating this new Jew in the land of Israel was also the idea of blurring the ethnic uh, identities. Uh, and this was particularly true of the Mizrahim, the Sfaradim, the Jews from Arab countries. Um, but I think it went even further than that. While much of this has changed, there are still strong elements of collective identity in this country. And those are supported, as you, as you already pointed out, by national service, um, by the fact that we're still in a warlike situation with the Palestinians and face threats from Iran. Those things strengthen our collective identity. But it's also reflected, it's also strengthened by the strength of youth movements in Israel. Not as strong as they once were, but still very, very powerful agents of socialization here in the country uh, that help create that national identity uh, uh, and, uh, and also by the collective identity is strengthened by a very strong sense of volunteering. Uh, there are thousands of volunteer organizations in Israel, um, but there are thousands of volunteer organizations in any Western country and certainly in, among Jews. But I want to point out something that I think is pretty unique to Israel. I don't think it exists too much in Jewish communities abroad. And that is that it is, it is not uh, rare that there are people in Israeli society who move to a development town or to some town on a border as an ideological statement, as an attempt to help the local populace, not just to give money and not just to volunteer there after hours, but to actually set up their lives there. Um, and, and that's a relatively uh, common thing that you see in Israel. That's, it's not even considered remarkable uh, that people do such things. I'd say the, the equivalent I can think of is, is uh, young Americans going to the Peace Corps. Um, but we know how rare that is. So this collective identity is, I think, uh, a very important factor that we'll be looking at in our virtual tour. And um, of course, there are other questions of identity we'll come across as well. The questions of immigrants versus native-born Israelis, Sabras. The question of Ashkenazim versus Mizrahim or Sfaradim, Jews from Arab countries versus Jews from Christian countries. So 
let's begin. And I'm going to share the screen. I hope everybody can see it. Um, and let's begin. Okay, hold on one second. I am screen sharing. There we go. Um, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. We're about to enter the Beit Kfarot Tzvai, the military cemetery. It's not the only military cemetery, unfortunately, in Israel, but it is the main one, the central one. Uh, on Yom Azikaron, Israel, Israel's Memorial Day, um, this is where the uh, president and prime minister generally come. Other elected officials go to the uh, smaller ones. Okay. And our first stop is going to be this particular area. And uh, in order to be able to get the words that you can barely make out here, um, I had to divide it into two slides. It says here, Ukivatstim miyakate aretz, and I will gather them from the far reaches of the land, ve'atzmoteichem kadesha tifrachna, and your bones uh, will uh, flourish or grow like grass. It's actually two separate quotes that were brought together from the Hebrew Bible. And let's go inside and see what's inside here. And here we can see that uh, there are plaques. This is actually not a burial place. Our first stop is not a burial place. Um, and let's read the one on the right. It's Shimon Kobe is the name of the person. And Ben Yehudit to Shlomo, the son of Yehudit and Shlomo, Nolad be Yerushalayim, born in Jerusalem, Nafal bekrav be Yerushalayim ha'ir atika. He fell in the battle for Jerusalem in the old city. And the date is Yud Chet Shvat, the 18th of Shvat, 1948. I don't have the English date in front of me, but I'm guessing that sometime in February, 1948. Ben Shmonas Rebbe he was 18 years old when he fell. And then you see this acronym, Tehei Shmato Chayim, may his soul be bound up with that of the, with those of the living. And you'll notice if you look to the left, there's almost an exact copy. There are only a few variables, the name of the person, their serial number in the Israeli army. On the left, it's 174058. You see it under the symbol of the IDF. Of course, the names of the parents, where the person was born and where they died, in this case, actually the same. Born in Jerusalem, died in the battle for the old city and the date of their death. In this case, the 8th of ER, which is three days after the state was proclaimed, 20 years old when Shulamit Kobe, a woman, the daughter of Yehudit and Shlomo. Oh, that's interesting. I never put that together even. I did not do this on purpose, but it looks to me like this was a brother and sister, Shulamit Kobe and Shimon Kobe. I can't believe I didn't even notice it myself. This is a brother and sister. And the brother died, even though he was two years younger, a few months before the state was proclaimed, because the battle for the old city began while the British were still in Palestine, before the state was declared. And, uh, and Shulamit, his sister, uh, dies on the 8th of ER only a few days after the state was declared. The Jewish quarter of the old city, of course, is lost. Uh, 
the Jordanian Arab Legion conquers it. But what I'm trying to point out here is there's a formula. There's a formula for each of these plaques. And if we look at these two, which is not brother and sister and not two brothers, we can see Yaakov Shevach Lebanon, the son of Yaffa and Eliyahu Yoshua, born in Tzfat, fell in defense of the old city on the 18th of ER, about two weeks after the state was declared, 19 years old. And on the left, Yitzchak Mizrahi, the son of Rivka and Tzio, born in Jerusalem, died in the battle for the old city on Yud Dalit ER, about a week after the state was declared, nine days after, 36 years old. You see that the formula is exactly the same. The name of the person, the name of the parents, where they were born, where they fell, the date they fell, their age, and may their souls be bound up with those of the living. This entire area is for those who fell in defense of the old city. And they're not buried here. They were actually buried in the old city itself in the Jewish quarter during the fighting. And as the Jewish quarter fell and came under Jordanian rule, their bodies were never brought to Israel proper until the 1967 war. When Jerusalem was liberated by Israeli forces and the bodies were then buried, not here where this monument is, but their bodies were buried um, in, uh, in a proper way. This brings us to our next stop. And I'd want to, uh, I'd want to ask uh, here, what do you see? And you can answer on the chat. See, I wonder if I would, right, I'll let you look at it for another second or two, and then I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so that I can see the chat. What do you see over there? I'll, I'll bring it back in a moment. What does it look to you to be? It's art, so uh, the interpretations can be uh, quite wide. Any ideas? Carol sees emptiness. Okay. Elena sees steps. Good. Actually, uh, so this is actually, um, hold on one second. This is actually a, uh, I have to go back and I'm not sure how to go back right now. My techn technological uh, limitations are starting to show. Give me a moment. Okay. So. Yeah. So this is actually the, um, this is actually the, uh, memorial to an Israeli submarine. And you can make out the shape of a submarine here in the art. Uh, it's the submarine called the Dakar. The Dakar uh, was a submarine, a used submarine that Israel purchased from Britain. Uh, and uh, on January 9th, 1968, it set sail from Portsmouth, from the naval yards in Portsmouth towards Israel. It reached Gibraltar six days later where it refueled and began to travel through the Mediterranean from Gibraltar with its destination being Haifa at the other end, the eastern terminus of the Mediterranean. The last communication was on January 25th 
He was due to arrive in Haifa only a few days later. And the search began on the 26th of January. Nothing was found. On March 6th, the army pronounced that the sailors aboard the submarine Dakar were to be considered dead, were declared dead. It was only 31 years later, in 1999, that the Dakar submarine was found at the bottom of the Mediterranean, 2,900 meters below the sea, 250 miles from Haifa. And here you can see this was actually added on in 1999, uh, it was recovered from the submarine. It's a part of the submarine. I don't know submarines well enough to tell you exactly which part it is, um, but uh, this is a part of the submarine that was actually recovered and added to the monument uh, in 1999. This says, in memory of Oniat Chelavir, um, Israeli naval vessel Dakar, whose serial number was 77, and there's a beautiful quote here from Tehillim from the Book of Psalms. In the sea will be your way and your path in many waters and your footprints or your uh, remnants will not be known. from chapter 77 of Psalms. And to enter, enter the memorial, one has to go downstairs. Of course, this is very symbolic. I think the artist here really hit it right on the nail. You're going down, you're going into the depths. You're coming out of the bright Jerusalem sun. And you go into a corridor and your eyes actually have trouble adjusting because it's quite dark. On the other hand, you could see at the very end, there is some light. Right here, you could see some of the darkness and the light at the end. And then you come out to this memorial. Of course, there's no one buried here either. These are memorial plaques to the 69 sailors aboard this submarine that tragically sank to the bottom. We assume it was not foul play, but rather a technical mishap. And what's remarkable here is as we walk through this monument and we look at these 69 plaques, we'll notice something remarkable, right? Yecheskel Sasson, the son of Salima and Nuri, I'm reading from the right side, born in Iraq. And look at the left, Alexander Sharoni, the son of Clara and Chaim, born in Romania. So we have Iraq and Romania. And Shlomo Ofek Opechinsky, right? He had a diaspora name and they changed it to an Israeli name the son of Batya and Svi, born in Poland. Ran Shimon, the son of Miriam and Shimon, born in Bulgaria. Avraham Baz, born in Tunis. Yosef Chaim Suisa, born in Morocco. Chaim Barzaev, born in Germany. David Ben Shalom, he also had a diaspora name, Yadlovker born in Russia, Menachem Degani, born in Hungary, Reuven Gal, born in Argentina, Mikhail Hadar, born in Morocco, Azriel Dror, born in Italy. You get the idea. We're talking about Kibbutz Galuyot, the ingathering of the exiles, of the 69 sailors, they come from 20 different countries, not counting Israel. 
That's quite a remarkable percentage. But it's the plaque on the right here that I want to draw your attention to. Mayor Yarom, the son of Rachel and Moshe, born in Kafrisin, Cyprus, Cyprus. Was there a Jewish community in Cyprus? I imagine some of you have already figured this out. This is 1968. He's 20 years old. He was born in 1948 in a detention camp in Cyprus. Of course, the illegal immigrants, the Aliyah Bet, who tried to come to the land of Israel against the British blockade, were at first sent back to Europe. I'm sorry, at first they were imprisoned in Palestine, and then they were put in detention camps in Cyprus. So Mayor Yerom is the son of two of those detainees from Cyprus who tried to make Aliyah against the British blockade. Yishiyahu Yochai on the left, the son of Clara and Shlomo, born in Turkey. Shevi Yaakov Mayer, again, Polovitz, but they, they changed his name to Maor, the son of Ella and Yechezkel, born in Lithuania. Yisrael Karmi, Weinstein, was born in Egypt. Ruvain Snapir was born in Austria. Binyamin Maimon was born in Latvia. Avraham Atari was born in Yemen. Yitzchak Ogen, the original name was Markovitz, but they Hebraicized it, was born in France. So the story of the Dakar is the story of the ingathering of the exiles, Ashkenazim, Mizrahim, not only native-born Sabras, but many, many children of immigrants, immigrants themselves, who were born in foreign countries, came to Israel, served in the Navy, and tragically died in the terrible accident of the Dakar. But I want to point out again that the formula is still the same. And here our uh, our next stop takes us to an area of the battle for Gush Etzion. Gush Etzion are a series of settlements south of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Hebron. Um, a Jew by the name of Holtzman bought land there in the 1920s and in the 1930s. A number of settlements were established including at least one kibbutz, I think there were two kibbutzim, uh, and uh, some were religious, some were not religious. There were four settlements established. Uh, these settlements were actually uh, quite isolated, surrounded by Arab villages outside of the major Jewish population centers. They came under attack after the UN partition resolution was proclaimed on November 29th, 1947. Most of the children were evacuated, as were the children. Most of the women and children were evacuated. A siege was laid on the settlements. And uh, in January 1948, 35 young volunteers, many of them students at the Hebrew University, members of the Haganah, the Israeli uh, uh, underground militia at the time, uh, tried to reach Kfar Etzion by foot. Uh, they went at night. Ultimately, they were spotted and they were killed. And what we're looking at here in the foreground are the graves of the Lamed Hay, the 35. Some of you may know there's a street near Pardes in Katamon named for the Lamed Hay, the 35. Uh, in general, the neighborhood of Katamon, uh, the streets are named for uh, the War of Independence. And here we have a common grave of those who fought in the last holdout in Kvaratsion. 
The reason they're buried in a common grave is unfortunately their bodies were mutilated. And I want to focus on two people here. Esther Kaufman, the daughter of Bluma and Moshe, I'm reading on the right, born in Poland, made Aliyah in 1947, fell in the battle for Gush Etzion on the 4th of ER, 1948, the day before Israeli independence was declared, the day before the British left. That was the day that the last holdouts of Gush Etzion fell, that Kfar Etzion fell. That is the day that is Israel's Memorial Day, the 4th of ER. She was 24 years old when she died. A Holocaust survivor, in fact, the sole survivor of a very large family. Let's look to the left, Zalman Kaufman, the son of Krindel and Yehuda Yosef, born in Czechoslovakia, made Aliyah in 1945, immediately after the war fell in the battle for Gush Etzion on the 4th of ER, 1948, 28 when he fell. And in the bottom line says that they were members of Kibbutz Kvar Etzion. Zalman and Esther were both survivors of the Shoah. They were both sole survivors of their families. They met in Kvar Etzion. They married and they began a life there that ended much too prematurely as they were among the last defenders of Kfar Etzion. I just want us to think for a moment what it means they had no children, that they were each a sole survivor and their family lines ended with them in 1948. David Ben-Gurion writes in his autobiography that the, the defense of Gush Etzion kept the enemy at bay and ultimately saved the city of Jerusalem. We continue and we come to a series of graves. Again, these are common graves because unfortunately their bodies were mutilated. And uh, these are people who died fighting the Battle of the Castel. The Castel is a hill outside of Jerusalem. The road to Jerusalem was blocked in a siege uh, and um, the Kostel was a very strategic point. Ultimately, the Jewish forces were able to prevail there, but at heavy cost. Uh, and uh, we can't see it, but if you look, if you look at the end, of, at the, at the uh, background, you see amongst the trees, there's a little opening. Um, and uh, you could actually see the Kostel from there, uh, which is why they placed it here. 1948 war was the most deadly of all of Israel's wars. 6,000 uh, Israelis were killed, more than any other of our wars. We're moving on now to 1956, the Sinai campaign. And these are two graves. These are actual graves of individuals that are right next to each other. And I just thought it would be interesting in terms of identity to contrast the two of them. Nuri Rachamim on the right, the son of Naima and Salah, born in Iraq, made Aliyah, I believe that that is 1951, fell in the Sinai campaign, the 1st of November, 1956, 22 years old. He has no rank listed. I assume that means he's a private. And look at the left. In a grave, very similar, same formula. Asaf Simchoni, the son of Yehudit and Mordechai, born in Nahalal, 
very important Moshav in the north. 1922, fell in Sinai, died 1956, 34 years old. But if you look under the IDF symbol, it lists his rank. He was an aluf. He was a general. His grave is the same size as Noi Rachamim, a private. This is part of the collective identity. This is part of the socialist egalitarian ideal that generals are buried next to privates. And unless you read very carefully, you can't tell who's the general, who's the private. We come to the grave of Shlomo Alman. Shlomo Alman, we're moving ahead a couple of decades. The son of Esther in Israel, born in Jerusalem, fell in battle in Lebanon in Operation Peace for Galilee, which was the first Lebanon war in 1982. And he was 20 something when he died. He was a gunner in a tank. Shlomo Alman, whenever I go on Yom Karon and I take Pardee students and I, I don't come this close because that's when I see the family of Shlomo Alman standing by the grave. His father, Yisrael Alman, was a professor at Hebrew University. He was born in Brooklyn. I'm sorry, he was born in Germany. Uh, and then uh, left in 1938 as a child came to the United States, settled in New York. At some point, he did live in Brooklyn. Uh, he went to City College and then MIT, made Aliyah in the 1950s, became a professor at Hebrew University, professor of economics. His specialty was game theory. And he actually was one of Israel's Nobel Prize winners. He won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2005. His eldest son was Shlomo, who's buried here. And there's a story I want to share with you. You know, Rabbi uh, uh, Shlomo Alm, uh, Yisrael Alman, excuse me, Professor Alman. Professor Alman was a religious Jew, and he also studied Talmud. He studied Talmud in a nearby yeshiva with a rabbi named Yisrael Zev Gustman. I once uh, sat in on a shiur of Rav Gustman when he was still alive. His yeshiva is in Rechavia, uh, on Rechov Ramban. Uh, and uh, Rav Gustman was a survivor of the Shoah, and he named his yeshiva Yeshivat Nili, Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishaker, the eternity of the Jewish people will not fail. He had the appearance, appearance of a Haredi rabbi. And Professor Alman was part of a small group of professors who would learn Talmud with Rabbi Gustman. And after Professor Alman's son Shlomo died, the following story is told. On his way back from the military cemetery, Rav Gustman, turned to another passenger in the car and said, they're all holy, every single one of them. He turned to the driver and said, take me to Professor Alman's home. Rav Gustman entered the Shiva house and he asked to sit next to Professor Alman. And Rav Gustman began to tell him the following. I'm sure you don't know this, but I had a son named Mayer who was taken from my arms during the Shoah and executed. My mayor is a kadosh, he is holy. He and all the six million who perished are holy. Rav Gustman then added, I will tell you what is transpiring now in the world of truth in Gan Eden, in heaven. My mayor is welcoming your Shlomo into the minion. 
and is saying to him, I died because I am a Jew, but I wasn't able to save anyone else. But you, Shlomo, you died defending the Jewish people and the land of Israel. Rav Guzman continued, I never had the opportunity to sit Shiva for my son, Mayor. Let me sit here with you just a little longer. Professor Auman replied, I thought I could never be comforted, but Rebbe, you have comforted me. On the left-hand side, you can see that the bushes are in a circular outline. And they're in a circular outline because these burial places, these graves, some of them are not graves, some of them are memorial plaques, are for parachutists. Parachutists, including Hanasenesh, the door of Katrina and Bela, and Bila, a member of Kibbutz Kesaria, born in Hungary, and was sent in the service of the people of Israel to the land of the enemy. She died in Budapest. Hannah Senesh was one of a series of parachutists from Palestine, recruited by the British in order to uh, land in Nazi-occupied Europe, in order to try to uh, create resistance to the Nazis, and also in the case of Jews from Palestine, to try to help the Jewish communities there. She was 23 years old when she was executed. And uh, her story is, I think, uh, quite well known. Her body was uh, transferred to Israel after the fall of communism. And as you can see here, she doesn't have the IDF symbol. She has the Haganah symbol all the way on the right, opposite the parachute. This is the pre-state period. She was a member of the Haganah, the uh, Jewish Self-Defense Force. We're now looking at a uh, Kever of somebody whom some of you uh, may know the parents of. This is Alex Lerner Singer, the son of Susan and Max. Max recently passed away a few months ago. Sue Singer, uh, who lives in Baca, right near Pardes, was a long-standing board member of Pardes and continues to be an important Pardes supporter. She was the editor of Moment Magazine in America. Alex Singer was born in the United States. He made Aliyah in 1985. And he joined the Israeli army, he joined the paratroopers. He went to officer training school. He became a officer in the Israeli army. Fell in a battle in Lebanon in 1987 when he was 25 years old. Alex Singer was an extremely talented young man. He was a poet, a writer, an artist. Uh, if you Google him, uh, I think you'll be very impressed. He uh, was a graduate of Cornell University, a real idealist. And I want to share with you a poem that he wrote when he was an officer training school. He wrote it on August 17th, 1986. And he wrote the following. Once in a while, as I progress toward the course's end, I feel a pang of fear. Today, I felt such fear. If the war comes, when the war comes, I will have to lead men to die. But those men were not men a short time ago. Some don't even shave yet. And I will have to have the calm power to yell to them 
or to whisper. Kadima. And I will have to have the calm power to step forward myself. As we continue on our tour, we come to a memorial that's quite recent, relatively speaking. It's actually a monument to World War II but it was only dedicated in the 1990s. And if you look to the right at the Hebrew inscription on the right-hand side, it says, in memory of the 200,000 Jewish fighters that fell in the service of the Red Army in World War II. And the verse from scripture, Leman dat orot b'nei Yisrael, so that future generations of the Jewish people will know is from the book of Judges, and you see in very large letters, 200,000. Just to put that in perspective, um, a little more than 400,000 American soldiers were killed in World War II. That's all American soldiers. 200,000 Jewish soldiers died in the Red Army. World War II was fought to a large extent on the Eastern Front. The question is, why would somebody build this memorial only in the 1990s? Why not build it after World War II? Why not build it after the War of Independence when they established the cemetery? And the answer is that here we can already begin to see the shift from collective identity to a more uh, ethnic identity and individual identity, which we'll see later on even more so. Because the Russian Aliyah of a million Jews from 1989 to 1999 the whole country had six million people, by the way, when that million Russian Jews came, former Soviet Union Jews came. There was an attempt to try to bring them into the story, not only to recognize them so that the rest of the Jewish people should acknowledge the great sacrifice Soviet Jews made in World War II to defeat the Nazis, but it was a way of also including them on this mountain, on this story, giving specific recognition to them. Look under the verse from the book of Judges in the middle and you see that there is, there is Russian language. There's, Russian, there's a Russian sentence there. That's a foreign language. You don't find that anywhere up to this point until the 1990s. This is the beginning of the breakdown of the melting pot. It's not even the beginning. It's already a result of some of the breaking down of the melting pot, the acknowledgement of ethnic identity. Another example of this is the formation of the Shas party uh, of uh, Jews from Arab countries, founded by Rav Ovadi Yosef in the 1980s or early 90s, around the same time. So there's this, this breakdown of the, of the homogeneous collective into smaller, more recognizable parts. We fast forward to 2006. This is the grave of Michael Levin. Michael Levin, the son of Hindalea and Mayor Akoin. Born in the United States, actually in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. Made Aliyah in 2003. Fell in a battle in southern Lebanon in the Second Lebanon War in 2006 at the age of 22. Michael Levin's grave has become a kind of pilgrimage site 
for lone soldiers, for American Jews, birthright groups, always stop here when they come to Har Herzl. And you'll notice that there's a footstone. We haven't seen a footstone anywhere else until this point. An American Oleh whose love of God and Israel is eternal. You know, Michael Levin was in America when the Second Lebanon War broke out. He came back to Israel to serve with his unit and tragically was killed. Now, everything else that you see there, the picture of Michael, uh, all of the, the kippot, the hats, the insignias, they're left by other people, the flags, they're left by other people. But you can even see on an official level, the footstone is an indication that we've moved now into an era of greater recognition of the individual, of the breakdown to some extent of the collective identity, and a move towards greater individuality and the individual identity. And here we can see other examples of it, not far from Michael Levin, in the more recent sections. Here you can see on the right, a footstone, a, a verse from Psalms. And on the left, you can see an Ethiopian Jew by the name of Asher, and uh, you can see here that the family added a picture of him. Something that we don't see in any of the earlier sections. On the right as well, there's a picture as well as the footstone. And it continues. This is the grave of Sari Tichezkel, the daughter of Tziona and Mashiach, born in Tel Aviv and uh, fell in 2005. And at the bottom, as opposed to the formulaic description of the headstone, the footstone is an emotional statement. Our granddaughter, our daughter, our beloved sister, you are forever inscribed. Your smile is in our heart. Sarit, the daughter of Mashiach and Siona. Here I just took a picture of the row and you can see this row, there's a footstone on every grave. Again, reflecting an individuality, an addition to the collective formula that's, that comprises the headstone. David Papian. We hear the footstone is actually in Armenian because he was a Jew from Armenia. And here we can see on the right hand side, there is a grave which has been planted not with the typical low bushes, but planted with other plants, so much so that you can't even see the headstone. In fact, there is no headstone. There's a surfboard. And on the surfboard, it's written, who's buried here? Uh, here's his picture. I'm sorry I didn't take a close-up to be able to read to you who it is. But what a, what a far distance from the collective identity to this individual who was a surfer. And here too, Yaakov Kochkin, whose picture is here, and you can see again, instead of the typical low bushes, they planted flowers, they've added flowers, that personal individual touch as well. This is our last slide. And it literally says, Area Dalid, Area 4, Chalka, Section 8. What you don't see is that it marks a section of the cemetery that's empty. 
Sadly, this cemetery is still active and most probably will continue to expand. We've explored part of Israel's history together. We've seen a lot of different aspects of identity in Israeli society, native born versus immigrants, Ashkenazim and Sfaradim or Mizrahim. We've seen changes in the move from a very collective society to one that allows for more individuality with less collectivity and allows even for expressions of individualism, even in this place. So I would like to thank you all and allow for questions. Mike. Is, is Herr Herzl reserved only for people who died in combat? Uh, it's a good question. First of all, there's a second side of Herr Herzl that I didn't describe. And that is the place of uh, Gedolei Ha'uma, uh, the giants of the nation. Uh, for example, Theodor Herzl is buried there. Hence, it's called Herr Herzl. So is Zev Jabotinsky. So is Yitzhak Rabin uh, and a number of other prime ministers, um, as well as some cabinet ministers. Uh, so that's one section. The military cemetery uh, is uh, generally only for soldiers uh, who die in battle. Uh, I think there are some exceptions. Uh, they're also victims of terrorism. Uh, and I have to tell you that uh, oftentimes, again, this is some of the strength of the collective even today. When someone is killed in a terrorist attack uh, and buried on a Herzl, oftentimes hundreds and sometimes thousands of people will come to their grave, to their funeral on her Herzl, to their burial. Um, people, not only family and friends, people who don't even know them, but are just moved by the story and by the moment. In fact, when Michael Levin, a lone soldier, died, there were thousands of people at his funeral because the word went out, he's a lone soldier. Thousands came to his funeral. And in that sense, the collective is still very much alive. Excuse me, David. Yes, Robert. I'm, I'm aware of, of one uh, person you're muted, Robert. Hmm. Robert, you're muted. Okay. You're, you're muted again. No, I, ju I just wanted to, as a, a point of information, uh, I'm aware of a soldier who actually died in an off-duty uh, mishap uh, from our synagogue who was buried on uh, our Herzl. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are, unfortunately, numerous cases like that. Uh, training accidents. Um, sure. Is that a Jewish cemetery? Yes. Are non-Jews buried there? Uh, so non-Jews are not buried there. There are non-Jewish military cemeteries as well. Who, um, who manages the... Uh, standards. Obviously, there's some leeway, but with technology changing so much, I've heard of cemeteries in the U.S. where they actually have recordings of the deceased voice that are embedded in, into the stone. There, there must be somebody responsible for boundaries on, on, on uh, how to memorialize someone. Yes, that is the army. The army is responsible for that. It is a military cemetery. Um, the uh, Yes, it's maintained by the army, and uh, they set the standards. D David, um, sure. Do Karen. all do all cemeteries well in Israel now reflect this sort of um, individual uh, identity? Is this sort of a, a does Mount Herzl represent what your story, what you just told, represent what's going on in Israel in terms of identity and? how that's reflected in a, a cemetery plot? 
Sure. Um, first of all, civilian cemeteries, um, people were always able to put whatever they wanted to uh, on a gravestone. Uh, it didn't have a formula. Uh, and, uh, and so there was always individuality. Um, there's much more so today. Um, that is, the boundaries of what's considered acceptable uh, have widened. But this parallels much larger uh, phenomenon uh, phenomena in uh, Israeli society. If I talk about the kibbutz as the ideal during the time of the greatest uh, collective identity, well, you know, the kibbutzim have all been privatized. And the Socialist Party is no longer in power. Uh, and uh, Israel is a capitalist country. Uh, and we have much wider gaps between the rich and the poor in Israel than we had 40, 50 years ago. Um, so all of those things are part of the picture, uh, and this is just a case study. I see Robert's hand is up, but if there's somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Okay, go for it, Ro Robert. Okay, I just also wanted to mention that on, on one occasion, a number of years ago, we went to our Herzl on uh, Memorial Day, and we, in the course of browsing around, we noticed there were a few headstones uh, which were uh, marked with the revisionist version of the, of the, of the map, and uh, the soldier was identified as Javer Etzel. Yes, yes, so that, that is from the pre-state period. And the map that you're referring to, which shows the boundaries of Mandate Palestine uh, from uh, when the British first received the mandate in 1923 at the San Remo Conference, which included both the Western Bank of the, uh, of the Jordan and the East Bank of the Jordan. Uh, so that reflects the ideology of the Etzel, the Irgun, uh, which was a pre-state organization. And members of the Etzel are buried uh, on her Herzl as well, uh, just like Hannah Senesh is. In fact, not far from Khan Senesh. Was, uh, was Har Herzl deliberately situated close to Yad Vashem? Um, Har Herzl was placed there before Yad Vashem was created. So the question should be, was Yad Vashem placed close to Har Herzl? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know that uh, in recent years, uh, they built a path, a special pathway, uh, from the edge of Har Herzl to Yad Vashem in order to literally connect them, not only by the street, but by a special path. Um, but I don't know whether it was uh, done purposely. Yes, Carol. My son is overhearing and he's asking if there are any like undercover soldiers or Mossad, um, you know, members of Mossad who are buried there, and if, that, if there's information given about them? Yes, so um, there are, uh, there is a section uh, for um, uh, people who served in Israeli intelligence units. Uh, it's actually not too far, it's between the Dakar and the Gush Etzion section. Uh, and uh, that area the, the formula is more or less the same. It doesn't tell us too much about what they did. Um, but yes, there's a special section uh, for the intelligence units. Yeah, the names, mentioned on the yeah, the na the names are there though, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, names are there, dates are there. Um, some of them, of course, um, are not buried there, uh, but it's just a memorial plaque uh, because they were killed abroad and their bodies were never recovered. Um, like the Ellie Cohen story in Syria. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about like philosophically, why the change to the more individual? I'm thinking, I know that soldiers are brought there to be sworn in and to be kind of reminded about why it is that they're fighting for what they're fighting for. And I could see that in the beginning of Israel, it was, you need to know that we are all unified in our fight for survival. And that, you know, now it's thank you for serving in the Israeli army. You are still an individual and that this, you know, everybody needs to know that we, we value you 
as a human being, or if it was almost, I had this right in my head and it's not gonna come out of my mouth right, but that it was almost the opposite, that the, it's not gonna come out right, but that the, the need isn't there as much as it once was, or that we need to be doing things differently so that we still have people from everywhere willing to, still feeling like this is their job. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very good question. My answer will not be as good as your question. I think the question deserves a lot more research. Uh, my, my short answer uh, is that uh, it's a combination of factors. Um, it's Israel moving from being an embattled, economically third world country uh, to being a uh, modern neighborhood superpower. Um, still facing threats, without a doubt. Uh, it's, it's Israel's westernization. You know, when, when the Beatles first came out, uh, David Ben Gurion did not allow their music to be played here in Israel. Uh, Israel did not have television until after the Six Day War, and it was purposeful because it was felt that television would corrupt the people and that they'd be exposed to all sorts of things. And it went against the socialist ideal and the ascetic ideal, you know, the ascetic ideal of, of not only a Ben Gurion, but a Menachem Begin who lived very modestly uh, and who eschewed any kind of luxury. Uh, and the feeling was that those things would westernize the country and those things were in certain ways going to ruin the country. Um, and those things happened after the Six Day War was felt we need to have TV just because we now have to counter Jordanian and Egyptian TV to the Arabs living in the newly conquered or occupied territories. Uh, and that was the excuse, but its time had come already. And yes, the Beatles can be played in Israel. Um, all of that are signs of westernization. The Arab boycott broke down in the 1990s. When I first made Aliyah in 1984, there were only a few car companies that sold to Israel. Uh, many companies didn't sell to Israel out of fear of the Arab boycott. Uh, and Israel's uh, gross, domest uh, gross uh, domestic product uh, was, was much smaller than it is today. So yes, all of these things are taking place. The, the uh, decline of the kibbutzim, uh, the decline of the labor party and of the left and of socialist ideals, which by the way parallels the decline of the left uh, in the 1980s and 90s uh, throughout most of the world. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I was excited to be able to do this virtually. Uh, I'm always excited to do it in person, uh, which was our original plan, of course, uh, but it's the next best thing. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.